I'm going to introduce our, we have two more, two more speakers. We're just wrapping up, and the party is rolling out there. So you guys are, it'll, it'll be fun. We'll have a fun night. Um, before I introduce anyone else, I want to do a huge thank you to our sponsor for the scientific conference for the last three years has been Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. And Dan Asbury's in the back of the room. And Dan has been here every year with us. And we all know how difficult it is to get insurance to understand Lyme. I mean, we don't understand Lyme very well, and these people are the smartest people that, about Lyme in, in the world, right, probably in this room. But um, but uh, they've been very supportive of our work, and uh, and we can't tell you how much it means. So we appreciate it. Dan's the best. So um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is Garth Ehrlich. And Dr. Ehrlich is professor of microbiology and immunology. Oh, and otolaring, yeah. Head and neck surgery at Drexel University College of Medicine. He also directs both the Center of Genomic Science and the Center of Advanced Microbial Processing within the Institute for Molecular Medicine and Infectious Disease and the Core Genomic Facility within the Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Please welcome Garth Ehrlich. Thank you so much. I really want to say thank you to personally to, to Tammy and Jessica, but broadly, I think, for everybody, for the incredible multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary fellowship that they have created around Lyme disease. It's kind of become like almost like an annual rite of spring to come out here, and I really, really enjoy uh, my time when I come out here to meet with people from all different walks of life, not, not just talking amongst our scientific and medical colleagues. So I'm going to talk about... Um, Advances in molecular diagnostics, okay, or DNA-based testing. And I guess I don't really need a disclosure statement here, but I don't have anything to disclose. What I want to talk about primarily is what we call a pan-domain molecular diagnostic, and I'll define what that means. The goal is to provide unparalleled sensitivity, accuracy, and breadth within the realm of molecular diagnostics for pathogen detection. And numerous studies have established that these types of assays have enormous power to provide data in support of paradigm shifts from everything from normal microbiomes to the ecology of numerous pathogenic processes. So the objectives of a pan-domain technology is to provide broad-based identification of any bacteria or any fungi without having to guess what to test for. And this is a real problem, of course, with, with tick-borne diseases because there are so many potential co-infections. And so what you would like to have is a test that could test, tell you everything that's there without you having to specifically say, I'm going to test for A, B, C, and D. So where we are now with this is the bacteria are considered a domain. We used to call them kingdoms. And so we have a pan-domain test for bacteria which we can identify if any, there's any bacteria in a specimen, and we can tell you the species of that bacteria. We are working on a parallel assay in my lab now for fungi and parasites. That one will hopefully be ready for prime time by the, by the end of this calendar year. So there's a lot of advantages when you're trying to do direct DNA testing. You don't have to culture. You're not relying on the organism to culture. And of course, many of these slow-growing organisms are very difficult to culture, or if they're formed of biofilm, they're very, very difficult to culture. You can also t test mixed populations of microbes. So as, as we were, I was saying, you know, these, these are often co-infections. We call these polymicrobial assemblages. And what you want is the assay to be quantitative. So you want to know how much of each organism is present in, in, your, in your specimen. Not just one organism, but every organism that's there. And you want really high resolution. So that means you want to be able to tell what the species is, okay? Not just the general class that it is. So you want to be able to tell it's Borrelia burgdorferi or it's Borrelia grinii or Borrelia miyamotai or something like that. And you want to be able to identify emerging agents that have never been previously seen, okay? Because, as, as I'll show you later on, using these assays, we find organisms that no one ever dreamed would be in places where we find them. And you want it to be cost-effective and high throughput. 
So these are some of the advantages of these pan-domain systems. They're kind of just to reiterate, they don't require cultural organisms. They work following antibiotic therapy because a lot of people know that if you treat with antibiotics and then try to culture, it can be very difficult to try to detect the organisms. You can detect biofilm bacteria or round bodies or anything, any other form that's there. You can detect multiple species simultaneously. You provide qualitative, quantitative data through the use of internal calibrants. You reduce workload, no need to develop new assays for each new organism that comes along. And we have now validated the, the bacterial pandemic assay using multiple um, test sets, uh, challenge sets that have been sent to us. So you may have also heard of panel-based tests. And so this slide is to kind of explain to you who don't, those of you who don't think about this every day, the difference between a panel-based test and a pan-domain-based test. Because they both are designed to be able to detect more than one species. With a panel-based test, you, know, you, you have multiple individual tests you're doing that are combined into one test tube. Okay? Whereas with the pan-domain test, you've got a single test that allows for identification of all the bacteria that are in that domain, oh, excuse me, all the organisms that are in that domain, okay? So it's truly just a single test. Whereas the panel-based tests, again, you'll only detect what you're looking for. So even if you've got 10 organisms in there and you haven't been infected with the 11th one, then you're not going to get it. Whereas the pan-domain test will detect any species, even unknown ones, within the targeted domain. The other issue with panel-based tests is you can have different sensitivities for each target since each one of them is a different assay. Whereas with the pan-domain tests, the sensitivities are largely equal for all. There are some minor differences. I'm probably not going to go through what, what those are today. <clears throat> the advantage, however, that panel-based tests have over a pan-domain test is because each test is separate, you can include pathogens from multiple domains. So you can have fungi and parasites and bacteria in the same uh, assay, but you, only the particular ones that you're looking for. And of course, with the pan-domain test, you're confined to a single domain. But that's what we're trying to develop now, a, if you will, a panel of pan-domain tests so we kind of get this coverage for everything. The disadvantages of all DNA testing, I need direct testing, is sampling error. And what do I mean by sampling error? There have to be organisms or pathogens present within the sample being tested in order, in order to, to, to identify them. You can't detect what's not there, no matter how sensitive your assay is. So I can have analytical sensitivity of my assay. I can detect one organism if it's there. But if I have a specimen that doesn't have one organism in it, I'm still going to get a negative. And that's, you know, that, that's the overriding weakness of any molecular diagnostic, and particularly with relation to, um, as we're finding out, um, borreliosis and particularly neuroborreliosis, where you may only have agents, you know, in the central nervous system, which are almost impossible to ask, ac access. So I just kind of said that. So with with that said, I'll kind of take you through um, quickly how a pan-domain assay works. So evolutionarily, there are certain parts of the any within any domain of an organism's genome or its genes which are very, very highly conserved. And generally these are ones that are associated with protein biosynthesis because every organism has to make proteins. And so we use genes that are associated with protein biosynthesis for these pan-domain assays. And primarily for the bacteria we use what's called the 16S gene. And these, the original assays that were developed using these pan-domain assays were very powerful in terms of getting some sense of the complexity of various microbiomes, how, how many organisms are approximately in your gut or in your nasopharynx or something like that. But they have um, real problems, the, 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 the current assays before we got involved with this. And the overriding one is there's a lack of specificity. So you could detect any bacterium that was there but you couldn't tell what species it was. You could say, well, maybe it's in this genus or this family, but it was very rare you could say, it's Borrelia burgdorferi or it's Staph aureus. And that's because of a technical reason that when you were, the way we 
get the specificity in these assays is we actually read the DNA sequence. And so everybody has a slightly different DNA sequence even though it's the same gene. And so, but the read lengths on early sequencing technologies are very short. They only read a very short piece of the gene. And so you can't get to species level um, sensitivity with that. Sometimes you can only get to family level. And they also, these sequencing technologies have high error rates. And so that means that because you're trying to count every read, because you want to have some sense of how many of each organism you have, because of the high error rates, you tend to overcall the number of different, you know, taxonomic units, genus, genus species, whatever that you have there, because you don't have a way to error correct. And so we have solved both of these problems um, with this technology that we've developed. Um, I'm just fighting with this here using this, what's called a third generation DNA sequencing system, and I'm not going to go through the details of it because we don't have the time, um, but it involved the development of new physics, new biology, and new chemistry. So it's really very revolutionary um, compared to what's been going on for the last 10 or a dozen years. And basically what it allows you to do is to sequence a much longer piece of DNA. So that's how you get the specificity. But how do you correct for errors with, when you're looking at single molecules? And this is really where there was some really very clever development that was involved. Oops, I didn't want to jump quite that quick. Okay, so if this is the piece of DNA that we have from our organism, the gold and purple here, so this is one strand and the other strand, what we do is we add on what are called smart bell, kind of a play on dumbbell, um, we call it DNA primers. So basically if you look what happens, is this turns this whole molecule into a circle, all right? And then when you start sequencing, the DNA polymerase, which is what does the sequencing, it just reads around and around and around the molecule. And so even though it's a single molecule, you read it many, many times. And so when you have, if you, when you have enough reads, you can put them all together and do what we call error correction. Because each one will have a few errors in it. But if you sum up against all of them, you can essentially eliminate all the errors. So now we have an assay which is, we can get the entire gene, which gives us the specificity, and because of the error correction, we have the accuracy. And this is my head of bioinformatics. Um, any, anybody who's involved in, in working in DNA diagnostics now, needs to have a good bioinformatician, and Josh is the guy who actually crunches all the data and developed all the alg algorithms. Um, and I'm going to kind of skip over this. I just want to um, show how accurate this assay is that um, Yark and, and Josh developed. I wish this slide would work. But again, I'm going to skip over this because we're short on time. So we were given this challenge set. This was a, a, a set um, and I, th I think you know, the earlier um, Jen was talking about this, how different laboratories send specimens among themselves so you can kind of test how good you are. So this was a challenge set um, that was sent to us. It has 22 different um, organisms in it. 20 of them are bacteria. One was a fungus and one's an archaea. So we knew we weren't going to get those two. Um, but we were able to, and this just shows that they're very widely separated across the entire bacterial tree of life, if you will. And so what we were able to do was show that when we looked at our, under our most stringent conditions, we could detect 19. We were hoping to detect 20 organisms. Um, we could detect 20 if we allowed a few more errors in. And what we finally realized was that two of the most common organisms that we always think of as separate species from a geneticist's point of view are actually the same species. Um, but we separate them clinically because they're, they're slightly different. So we just modified our algorithm a little bit, and now we can separate the, the, those, those two species of Staphylococcus, which you've probably heard of. So we're able to resolve, resolve 19 out of 21 with no false positives. And we were able to call them all with the, uh, an identity of, from 100% to 98.9%. Um, was, was our, our lowest accuracy across the entire spectrum. 
So I kind of went over this as well. So then we, got, and then we got a much larger, much more difficult set. This one had 240 bacterial species in it. Actually, it had more than that. They thought it had more than that. We actually went through and showed them that they had huge numbers of errors <laughs> um, in, in what they did. Um, and this is all coming out on a paper that we have, have submitted now. Um, but we were able to um, identify essentially every organism that was there, correct the errors that, that the people who put the system together in, um, and get quantitative results. So what you're looking at uh, here is this line, we're looking here is how many organisms of each species there are, you know, based on how far they are up on the y-axis, and then their expected relative abundance down here. And so what you see is that our, all our green dots fall right along this line. That means over three orders of magnitude, over, over, which means more, over more than a thousand-fold variation of input, the different input bacteria. We could not only detect them, identify what species they were, and put them in the correct relative abundance. And this is the first time anybody's ever been able to do this level of accuracy with a pan-domain assay. One of the interesting things was that there were, they claimed that there were 14 species within the genus of Clostridia, which is a bacterium that's associated with all sorts of um, bad outcomes. Probably a lot of you have heard of Clostridium difficile. Or, or botulism or something like that. And so we went through and we looked, could we find all 14 of these uh, species? Well, we found 13, so we were kind of disappointed. We missed one, we missed this one Clostridium bartletii. And then we started actually going through and looking at the data much more carefully. And what we found was that there was actually, somebody had changed the name in, in the databases, it was no longer Clostridium bacteria or bartletii, it was now called Intestinobacter bartletii, and indeed we found Intestinobacter bartletii. So we actually found all what used to be called 14, and, and correct, this was one of the examples where we were able to correct the mistakes from the groups that had put this together. Um, so, I'm just going to kind of skip over this. So at this point, we, we, we knew we had a very, very sensitive, very accurate, very quantitative assay. And so we turned this then initially because we're very concerned about the whole issue I was talking about with blood not being an ideal specimen for this, to actually look using it in a different area. So what we started doing is looking at the microbiomes of ticks. Okay, because we wanted to see, well, what are the ticks carrying? What different types of ticks they're carrying? What, what are they carrying in, you know, in different parts of the, parts of the country? Um, so, we, so we looked at three different types of ticks, Ixodes, Zamblimona, Dermacenter, I cut through this. So this is looking like it, at Ixodes ticks. Okay, these are the ones that um, are associated with carrying Lyme disease. And so what you can see here is each of these bars is a different tick. And as we go down the side here, these are all the different bacteria, okay, that we find in a tick, all right? So there's, there's over a hundred here, all right? So, and of course, the, the, the second most common organism is Borrelia burgdorferi. There's a, uh, a uh, rickettsia that's the most common up front, um, which I just learned is actually a commensal organism of, 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 of the tick gut. But there's a whole bunch of other pathogens, um, you know, in, in, the, in these ticks as well. But then, what I, just, I just show this just to give you an idea of how complex, you know, and, and people talk about ticks being a sewer. Well, this kind of gives you an idea, like they, they, they really, really are. This is, that now we're looking, um, you know, at, at, at Amelonia, you know, and, and, and Derma Center. And then this was kind of a summary slide uh, that my graduate student just put together, just looking at all the different possible species and, and how we can cluster them, the, 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 the possession across the different species. So I know we're running late. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Holly. I think he's going to kind of wrap things up. <laughs>